Hi everyone and welcome to episode 44 of the Stage Chef podcast with the Ivan Novella winning songwriter Ian Dench who's written songs for Beyonce, Shakira, um, he was the writer in EMF so he wrote that classic international hit um, Unbelievable in the 90s and um, we're really really pleased how this episode turned out so we hope you enjoy it. Um, for more episodes featuring Jennifer Batten on what she learned touring as Michael Jackson's guitarist for the Bad, Dangerous and History tours and um, Billy Burnett on an extraordinary decade in Fleetwood Mac, um, Shane Kiesa on um, playing at Graceland um, and touring for two tours with Elvis Presley um, and John Waugh for the 1975 on being saxophonist with truly the biggest pop band on the planet right now and loads more go to the stagechefpodcast.com follow us on Twitter um, at the Stage Chef Pod, like us at facebook.com forward slash the Stage Chef Podcast um, and let us know where you're listening from um, we've also got an Instagram page where you'll see photos of all the um, interviews that we do um, and we're available on Spotify iTunes and all podcast apps to listen to um, we do this for love aside two other jobs so if you want to buy us a coffee for troubles you can at our website um, our next episode is with Dan McDougall who not only drums with Liam Gallagher uh, but recorded all the demos for the what is now the platinum album as you were um, it's very revealing uh, it was great fun doing that interview last week in Barcelona so uh, we hope you enjoy it so that's coming up soon but here we go this is Ian Dench Okay, welcome to the Stage Left podcast, lifting the veil on the music industry by telling the stories of those with a unique vantage point. This podcast exists to provide free educational content for young musicians entering an increasingly complex industry by telling the stories of some of the unsung heroes behind the success. Today we have the Ivan Novello winning Grammy and Golden Globe nominated songwriter Ian Dench, who, not satisfied with writing the most infectious guitar riff of his generation, now collaborates with some of the most talented artists on the planet. Our guest today has written and co-written five songs with Beyonce, uh, as well as hits for Shakira, uh, Florence and the Machine and Ian Brown. Uh, today we'll be breaking down the creative process in the modern age of songwriting, um, telling some classic stories from the EMF days. Uh, we'll be finding out how Ian tailors his approach to each artist he works with and most excitingly for me uh, we'll be discussing what it was like recording a hit single with Vic and Bob. Um, so it's a pleasure to say that our guest today on the Stage of Podcast is none other than the original Epsom Mad Funker Ian Dench. Uh, thanks for joining us today Ian, how's it going? Hello, thank you. I'm very good thank you, very good. Thank you for that great intro. And <laughs> you, uh, you really are uh, uh, built me up thank you there we go um so we're going to begin because um last night there was the sad news that marquis e. smith of the fall passed away and you just mentioned that um, you actually supported his band once is that right yeah long long time ago in, in my band before emf uh up in mosaic we we supported him and and uh, our, our dressing room was ab above his dressing room and and i think we were making too much racket or, you know dancing about on the floor or something <laughs> and, his, and his wife Britt, came upstairs and like and told us to shut up and she right. was very nice about it she was she she um and uh and she was very nice but um we i think we were just like a annoying young <laughs> band and you know they were making such interesting important music yeah at the time and you know and it's it's uh it is a very sad passing because he he was a man who sort of you know explored new territory and sort of you know he, he's a sort of testament to how um personality c c can sort of trump form sometimes mm. you know and i think you know it's just by, by sheer sort of intellect and uh, and personality he 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 made great work and and uh you know, yeah, a very important artist, and it is a it is a, a sad news that that he's uh, gone. Yes, uh, very sad news, and thank you for for speaking about that. And um, before sitting down to research this interview uh, with you, um, I did wonder. I wonder how did someone from EMF um, go from working in EMF to, to kind of where you are now with some of the people you're you're working with? And I listened to EMF stuff in detail for the first time in the last week or so, and it really struck me how like sophisticated uh, some of the songwriting was, and for me, EMF, you know, as a kid growing up, they were the band who obviously very well known for Unbelievable and kind of a few naughty stories on tour and that kind of thing. As the main songwriter, did that frustrate you at the time that perhaps your 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 craft was being overlooked with the headlines about what the band were up to on tour and Unbelievable taking all the um, attention, if you like? Uh, no, absolutely not. I mean, I, I, it was a great meeting of of uh, of personality and and uh you know and music you know and i think one of the reasons that it was so successful was that you know it's a bunch of young looking guys with loads of stories about it and 
you know, it was a whole story around it. And mm. thankfully we had some good music to back it up. So it was a great package, I think. And, and, and that's why it worked so well. And, I, and, and, um, and also it was just great fun. You know, they're, they're just a great fun bunch to be around, always were and still are. And, and you're playing gigs at the moment, is it? We have been yeah. we're playing occasional gig. Yeah. And, and how's that been going? Tell us great. About that. I mean, amazing. Just, just so, so, um, so fun to still be doing it really and and we do and doing it because it is fun and mm. you know i think back in the day it, we toured so much it just became a little bit wearing and and we got tired really just you know we were on the road for so long and so so now we just do the occasional festival and and just and it's and it's great fun for that kind of thing do you need lots of rehearsals beforehand or do you just meet once a year and just on the stage and play how does that work so you can get back in the groove well i definitely need to need a rehearsal because <laughs> once you when you don't play for a couple of years at my age you, you end up forgetting what, um, all those bloody guitar solos i wish yeah. i hadn't written so many bloody <laughs> guitar solos and some of um, them really complex as well i was listening to them today and it's a very, i know you probably won't want to say but some of them are very complex and I thought, yeah so you must have to get oh, chops on it, right? it takes a couple of goes through to remember them and then and then i'm off and so do you just listen to the records or do you have a do you just book a rehearsal and how does it work yeah i listen to the records and try and remember them and then get in and and have a rehearsal and and uh there was a couple of songs that really stood out to me um listening to them that i there's one song i tell you it's the best course i've heard in about a year and this is a song from quite a few years ago first time i heard it called the same uh-huh. oh my god what a tune that is with that descending chord progression that i think you are pleasure over can't get enough of it maybe you can shine a light on that tune what do you what's your memories of that tune coming together that's so interesting that you brought that one up because We've only just put that one back online. Right, yes, that's, yeah, I saw it, yeah. Because that was um, part of... uh, Was the the Unexplained EP? Exactly, right, yeah. Exactly, Uh, which we did just after Schubert Dips, or after the first album. And and, um, it's interesting how you brought up the whole sort of... um, uh, I don't know the whole stories thing above above music. And Mm. with the first album, you know, we, we were on the front cover of the you know teeny mag mm-hmm. smash hits a lot and and was i don't know we sort of felt perhaps we'd been you know overlooked a little bit because we were you know considered to be teeny pop stars or something you know they people say oh they're, they're just like new kids on the block or something right. and they really get our goat and and you know we we've been listening to public enemy and the smiths and trying to put all these things together into our music and and uh and so we sort of made a conscious effort after schubert dip to do something a little bit harder and a little bit darker mm. and that was the unexplained dp and so the, the same was sort of part of that thing and uh, and there was something about you know i don't know about the sort of monotony of of being on tour I don't, you know i'm not even looking back on it i'm not even sure what that song is about yeah. but but there was something I don't know, you know, after going, you know, do you still feel the same after all this stuff? You know, yeah. what, 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 you know, what we've been through all this stuff and like we'd had this, the band had been started because we had this great vibe and we were having fun and, and then we went through all this stuff and, and is it still the same? Well, you know, I think that's what that song is about. And, but it's so strange that song was lost you know yeah, that song has never been tune. online that for so long and... unbelievable that chorus is so so good and another one i really really liked shining which is off the cha cha album is that right yeah yeah that is a great now that's the strings are really fundamental to that and they're probably the most prominent instrumental part on that track um or instrument on that track if you like um can you remember how that song was put together because that's a really interesting one because it is darker yeah compared to the first album and uh i knew you were going to ask about songs off cha 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 <laughs> and, and that was a, you know, that was a dark period, I suppose. I mean, it was, again, we were just probably exhausted. We'd just, mm. you know, we'd done two albums back to back and then gone away and sort of tried to write another one, but, and, and probably just lost our way a bit. I think we, we weren't quite sure what we wanted to be. We sort of wanted to be cooler, but, you know, we had this pop legacy and, 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 you know, and we just started writing these songs and some went this way and some went that way. And, and shining i guess was a little bit it was a sort of precursor to what happened to zach in a way mm. and uh 
and you know it was that it was a sort of feeling about like young people going wrong and I don't know what sort of song it was meant to be. It was sort of we were working with Johnny Dollar, and Johnny Dollar had produced the Massive Attack Blue Lines oh, album right. and okay, those sort of right. big things with those orchestral arrangements. And so I think maybe that influenced the the way it went, and mm. we sort of did this whole string section in Abbey Road in the. Well, in, that was at Abbey Road. That was a wow, like forty nice. piece string section. And, Sounds it, yeah, yeah, with the. Uh, in the room where the Beatles did all those recordings, mm. and it was I mean, it was a great moment. It was a sort of sad precursor of, of what, what happened, really. And and that whole whole album was just a a mess, really. We I think we were all a bit of a muddle, and and I think it shows. In what way? Because the songs is a song a little bit this way and a little bit that way, mm. and and even sort of our our attempt to pop with. Perfect day was so atonal, and it was. Mm. We were just sort of sabotaging ourselves all the time. We were like, okay, we'll write the pop song, but we make the chords so, you know, hard that, you know, nobody's going to accuse us of being a, a pop band, and mm. and it just, it just was self defeating. I think, and I think we just should have written some good songs and been happy with who we were, and because it was good. When I say to you the word unbelievable, as in the song. What's the first emotion that comes to your mind? I, I'm, I mean, I'm just very happy, really, because it's just been a, a, an amazing thing in my life. And it took us all over the world. It, it just gave, you know, EMF as a band an, an experience that few people have have had. And, you know, we went, went number one in America. We all made lots of money. What can I say? I think that's a great thing. Is it true that you came up with the riff? Whilst riding a bike, or is that is that a myth? Is no, that, that is the truth. That is the absolute truth. I I had a bed sit uh, on one side of Gloucester Park, and my parents had a piano in in their house on the other side of Gloucester Park. And I used to I used to go, go to my parents' house and and you know play the piano because I liked because I pretended I you know we were doing house piano on my mum's yeah. like on my mum's upright piano and. Uh, you know, I'd just been playing a bit and I just was, was going home to my bed sit, riding across the park. And, you know, all those songs at the time, were, were, I was writing them about my ex-girlfriend and mm. they're all like, you know, lies and yeah. and, and sort of there's some bitterness because she dumped me. And yeah. and I just I just thought, well, you know, you're unbelievable. That's interesting. You know, it's got it's got the two sides to it. You know, you're mm. you're sort of a liar and. And you're, oh, uh, right. and also you know you're amazing and yeah and then uh, na, 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 riding my bike you know and this riff in my head and and I just went back to my bed sit played it on the guitar you know wrote the lyrics and then took it to the rehearsal with with the band which which were happening sort of once twice a week that mm. at that stage and and bang and it was born and you talked about the impact that had on you. Um, uh, kind of from a from a holistic point of view, from a grander point of view, at the time that obviously really kind of saw a peak in your career. Um, how did that How did that affect you as an individual? I mean, I must say initially, I couldn't quite believe it, and I and I had struggled away for years. I'd I'd been in a like a indie band, and we'd yeah. had a couple of record deals, and, mm. and I hadn't sold a record, and struggled, and then all of a sudden, bang! You know, something I got it right. You know, and it's interesting how you brought up you know the stories and the and the mm. you know and and the other things and you can see how that had contributed and also you know years of songwriting and you know I'd been in an indie band where I tried to be like my record collection and I'd been a bit of this and a bit of that and and it had never sort of gelled and and so I thought okay we got to write a song we got to write an album that's got where the songs sort of are coherent where it's got a direction and Mm. and it's got a look and we're sort of you know and it's got some somehow it's a you know, a thing that exists in its in, in every dimension and and we you know and so we got it right finally but I'd sort of paid my dues and I must say initially I was I was I was thinking, look, this this is a bit too good to be true and, and I didn't sort of believe it and it was and it was great. It felt like playing a role and it was fun and 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 I hope it didn't go to my head. But even after, you know, after a couple of years, you can't help it because people say, oh, you're so great. And, yeah, you're amazing. And, and you start sort of believing the hype a little bit. Yeah. And, and then you think you're so important. And how do you change then? 
you know, you sort of think, oh, I'm so successful, anything I do is important, you know. And I think you just forget that, you know, people love listening to music because music is is speaks to some of them about their lives. Mm. That you know, there there are melodies and you know sounds that they that excite them and inspire them or touch them. And, and I don't know, you know, you, you you can't just sort of disappear into your own little world. You know, you 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 must remember the audience and yeah and i think that's something i'd done more and more and more as i'd moved towards emf you know i was thinking you know you've got to try and connect to the people mm. and i think ultimately why well, i had a bit of success because it's about connection and connection's not a bad thing you know i mean i think that's where, where you have to get that difference between pop and connection you know pop, pop is about connection yeah yeah there's sometimes there, there's connection to to a lot of people that's mm. the, and sometimes you get connection that's that's you know to to young girls that's just a bit bit sort of one dimensional or mm. uh, uh and then you perhaps you get things that are deeper and don't connect to so many people and and then you get you but but it's you know pop is not a dirty word it's like mm. it's it's about you know making that connection with people and and I'd sort of been moving towards that more and more, and we had that success, and I think we, we really got it right, and then sort of moved away from it. And I think that's sort of a, I think that's a shame, and I think I came back to that myself later on, mm. and sort of thought, okay, well now, you know, I need to make these songs that that connect to people again, and um, and, you know, not to try to be so obscure not so willfully obscure and is that a challenge uh is it is that yeah a you know so what is there a part of you that wants to be that kind of willfully obscure as you describe it uh no i don't i i do you know what i'm not good at being willfully obscure and i never have ah, been on that and interesting I, and so i don't want strength, to be, i guess right but yeah but what's just as bad is pretending to be pop mm. you know and i because i think really good pop is real it and I think either is as bad, you know, being willfully obscure and just trying to be cool is just as bad as being willfully pop and just, try, mm. and just trying to cheese it up to connect to as many people as possible. Because I think real pop is really good mm. and really does uh, um, touch people. And just as, uh, you know, real honest music does touch people. And I think, I sort of think they're the same, really. And... Um, and it's interesting talking about it and trying to trying to articulate what the difference is between those things. But really, they're the same. I think they're they're music and they touch people. And people put them in categories and say this is cool and that's not cool. And, and but but I think they're very they're on they're certainly on the same scale mm. of of you know mass appeal or lesser appeal. But but you know they. You know, good music touches people. When you're when you're writing now for for different artists, um, I'm interested in what is the input from? Do you get blueprints from record companies who say this is going to be for this artist and this is the kind of thing we're after, and you have to write to a blueprint, or is it a case that you've written songs already and then pass them over and they can do with them what they choose to? Both of those things. Um, often there are briefs attached to how a an artist or a band, um, how their image is and how their sound is. Um, and, you know, you can try writing to a brief and trying to fulfill that, um, you know, with, 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 with your will. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, sometimes it's, it's great when somebody says, Oh, you know, we need a song like this. And you're like, Oh, hang on a second. I got a song that's just, just right. Just like that. And great. Um, uh, and often, do you know who the artist is going to be, so you have them in mind, or in most cases, are you writing something for a particular genre? Often, again, both. both often, right. you know, yeah, it's, it's sort of great if you've got an artist in mind because it, it can guide you. And um, and sometimes it's great just getting in a room and writing a song with people and thinking, oh, well, that's a little bit like that, and just take, following where it takes you. And um, 
it is hard writing to a brief because you sort of you sort of force it into those those mm. sort of your understanding of how a, a you know a style of song is or or how a the sort of message that a singer might sing is um whereas perhaps if you do something from your heart about how you're feeling now it feel, feels a bit more authentic and a bit more real and um and then you can sort of let it go where it goes but if you're involved in commercial music you you sort of have to understand what's being played on the radio or what's you know what an artist's fans expect from them and 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 make sure that you're going down that uh that style uh, is that what happened with um Ave Maria so I'm guessing the blueprint there um Ave Maria which I think is a hymn the classic kind of classic using a bit of that with Hallelujah with the arpeggiating um the, perhaps the Jeff Buckley version because it's not quite prominent on the uh Leonard Cohen version kind of a dollop of Ave Maria, a slab of Hallelujah, go bake a cake. Is that pretty much how it works? Well, that's funny you mentioned Hallelujah because I've never thought of that one. But yeah, Ave Maria. Really? Absolutely. Yeah, really. Oh man. We were working with Beyonce on uh, this I Am Sasha Fierce album. Mm -hmm. um, when I say we, Amanda Ghost and I, who, who I wrote all those songs with. Yeah. Uh, and Amanda and Beyonce got married the same weekend. Right. And they both had Ave Maria at their weddings. Right. And I said, well, you know in classic American hip hop style, why don't we just, you know, take the riff and, you know, write a song around it. And that's what we did. So, you know, I just sort of borrowed the sort of feel mm. of Schubert's Ave Maria. Which is nice recall to the first album by him. <laughs> right, okay, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, yeah. I love Schubert. I've, mm. I've often gone to Schubert to borrow a chord or two and, you know, it's just got the Ave Maria... And and then we wrote a song about sort of saying there, but for the grace of God go I, you know, and mm. and just sort of wrote some things about Beyonce and Fish Bash Bosh. Do you ever get to work with Beyonce or is it a case that... Like, that was with Beyonce, yeah. In Beyonce the studio? was in, in the studio, yeah. And what was that? Tell us about that process. How does that work, the kind of to and from? So you've written a part and she sings it or is it a case that you do it together? How does that work? I mean, she was very open. She sort of said, look, what what you got, what you got. And we played her a couple of songs. In fact, she, she, I think she sang eight songs that we played her, uh, four of which ended up on the record. And then Ave Maria, we wrote there in the studio, sort of, uh, you know, about her, about with her. And it was interesting, you know, although, you know, she didn't necessarily um, come up with the ideas in the other songs, you know, she, she her vocal arrangements definitely made them uh, her own. You know, what a voice and... It was incredible. What would a, a young musician learn uh, from working with Beyonce that they might not learn from working with anyone else? Uh, she's the first uh, one to get to the studio. She's the last one to leave. So even at that stage when she's incredibly famous, I mean, I don't know, who, who knows, now she's got kids, maybe she's, yeah. she wants to get off, but but she worked incredibly hard and she was open. She She was not, you know, in terms of creativity, she was not a diva. She's mm. like... She was like, yeah, just let's see what you got. I'll try anything. I think that's, I mean, that's great. That's like, she, she's not like, oh, it has to be like this or it has to be like that. You know, it's like, well, let's see, let's give it a go. Subconsciously, does it affect you as a writer? Do you think knowing that this is definitely going to be heard by a colossal amount of people? Yeah, I guess. I guess it sort of makes you a bit nervous. You're like, ah. But also it's, I don't know, it's sort of, if, if something's, sort of real and authentic you and it touches you you sort of know that, that you know probably going to touch someone else as well and so mm. so great you know when somebody like that sings it and it's very exciting so back in the 70s and um, Barry Gordy who ran Motown Records um he uh, asked his writers his team of writers to um for, for every michael jackson uh, sorry jackson five song he, he kind of asked them to to write in a way so that a listener would know within the first few bars who the artist was even if they didn't know the name of the song and it's an interesting experience to kind of play this because 
the, even people who've not heard these particular Jackson 5 songs know it's a Jackson 5 in the first few bars. Um, something that's kind of cropped up in the last 15 years is, and I find it a slightly kind of ugly thing, is artists kind of name dropping their own name in the first few bars. And in Beautiful Liar, which I know you wrote, and I'm sure you didn't write this as the, as the lyrics, um, which I know you want an eye for novella for, the first thing you hear is Shakira and Beyonce say, Shakira, Beyonce. And then you, I think it then becomes the lyrics for the final chorus. Um, and interestingly, after Michael Jackson passed away with some posthumous, uh, some, uh, some recording that he'd done that was released posthumously with Akon, Akon went, Akon and MJ at the beginning. And it's like, we've already proven you don't need to do that with Michael Jackson. Um, so were you under instruction to include stuff like that? Is that something that's in, in conversation beforehand from the record company? How does that work? Do you know what? She just sang it on there. Right, okay. You know, the rest of the song Amanda and I wrote, but yeah. she just got on there and went, Shakira, Shakira, Beyonce, Beyonce. And I think Shakira just went, Beyonce, Beyonce. And, yeah, yeah. And, and I think she was just riffing. Is it contrived? Is it product placement? Is it so that as soon as the radio comes on in someone's office or in, in a public place, it's like, okay, yeah, so we know who it is? I think probably a little bit, yeah. Especially with a duet like that, you know. And it also establishes them on, a, on an equal footing. And, yeah. <laughs> and there's that whole video where they look the same. And Yeah, yeah. Um, what are your memories of composing that song? Because, I mean, that was a huge, huge hit, obviously. Well, that was a great moment because uh, um, Amanda and I were, were in New York. Amanda was playing a gig and um, I was basically, you know, in Amanda's band. Amanda was an artist. We wrote the songs together for her. She mm. it was Amanda. But Amanda had just happened to write Your Beautiful uh, with James Blunt. Yeah. Now Amanda hadn't written songs for other people. I don't. She just happened to meet James Blunt and written that with him, and that was just starting to be a success. Mm. Um, and Amanda said, "Oh, I got this phone call from this guy, who um, he said I love you know you're beautiful and I want you to write a song for Beyonce." And I'm like, she's like, it's, I don't know. It just sounds a bit creepy. I don't know, you know. So will you come with me and you know meet this guy? And I was like, yeah, sure, sure. Let's go see see what this is about. And mm. so we turn up this address, and lo and behold, it was the Universal Building on Fifth Avenue and um, and we went up and oh it was the Def Jam offices and we went in to meet this guy Tata Smith and uh, he he was like uh, oh there's somebody I want you to meet and in walks Beyonce and Jay-Z oh. like, whoa <laughs> and uh, they're like oh we want you to write a song for Beyonce and Amanda's like well you know I don't usually write songs for other people and you know I'm, I'm an artist and I was like, shut up, Amanda, shut up. <laughs> and, uh, and they were, you know, Tata was like, well, that's what we want. You know, we want a real song. We want an artist song. And we sort of said, oh, well, great. You know, well, you know, we can get to know you and, and like work in the studio and come up with something because that's how we wrote songs at the time. You know, mm -hmm. we, we were in a band, you know, you'd come up with an idea and try it with the band and try it this way and try it that way. And, um, and Beyonce said, I haven't got the time. Uh, you know, here's the backing track. This is going to be a duet with uh, Shakira and I. Uh, mm. And um, we've got the studio booked tonight um, to come and, you know, come to the studio at 8 o'clock. Wow. And we were like, what? And uh, But it was such a great opportunity. So Amanda and I basically wrote Beautiful Liar in the taxi on the way back to the hotel, in the hotel for a couple of hours, and then finished it off, off in the taxi on the way to the studio. And bang, we played it and... But there was, again, it, it, I suppose, you know, so many years have been lead, leading towards that point. I mean, it, the, the backing track had a um, had a sort of Spanish mm. guitar feel, which was the Shakira bit. Yeah. And it had the Stargate sort of hip hop drums, which were the Beyonce bit. And, you know, I played sort of Spanish guitar. And so, you know, I just played my Spanish guitar stuff. And uh, Amanda sang it like Beyonce style. And so the bits all came together and it. It sort of wrote itself because it had to be about female empowerment. It was Beyonce and it was about two girls and it just sort of, the bits fitted into place and they liked it and bish bash bosh and they just did it. So the key to winning an Ivan Novello is to write in a, in a taxi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just don't think about it too much. Boom. Just do it. That's, that's fantastic. Um, so are you, do you play on some of the records? Is it you playing instruments on some of the records? Or is it a case yeah, that... Yeah, on the yeah, Beyonce it's... records, yeah. Oh, so wow. I, do, I didn't pl pl play the guitar on Beautiful Liar, but I, uh, on Ave Maria, that's me tinkling the guitar there nice. on satellite. Um, 
disappear. disappear. Yeah. Is that another one that you yeah. do, Amanda? And how does yours and Amanda's working relationship? I wonder if you could tell us about that. Um, is it, obviously, you've you've written some stuff with her in, for, for many years. Um, what are her qualities? What are her strengths? What does she bring to the party? Um, she has she's pouring with ideas. Amanda's just like she she's got so much energy and and such a sort of force of will and um so these ideas are coming out and i think i just perhaps temper her a little bit and and you know give give a little bit of form to them and just say oh, i think that's a good one mm. and you know i think this is leading to here um maybe, maybe i just edit her a little bit and and that was a you know a really good relationship and and in 2008 a very fruitful relationship um uh but amanda's also a great businesswoman and she was given the job as president of epic records in 2009 and she asked me to go go with her and do that um and so we sort of left the songwriting a little bit behind mm. at that stage and 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 worked at epic together which was a, an incredible experience um she has gone on to make movies and is presently doing more of that and sadly writing a little less and I sort of came back to doing some writing and uh, because I miss the creativity uh, and mm. perhaps business is not my strong point. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but we still work together occasionally, you know, when, uh, when inspired and uh, we've been doing some work with a, an artist, Joel Compass right. uh, recently and together and that's been great. And we wrote the music for the house in TV sh series um, which is great together. So, you know, it's, it's a, Still you know, I can't remember, a very good friend and a, and a, an incredibly creative person. And, and I hope we always will, uh, work together. From a technical point of view, how would you say you personally evolved Beyonce sound in the tracks that you've, you've been involved in? I think that I am Sasha fierce album was an attempt to mature. Mm. And I think some of those songs that she did really were um, mature songs, like the Satellite and Disappeared and Ave Maria. You know, they were they were a move to to something deeper. And um, although I say what's what's uh, sort of uh, funny about that record is that Single Ladies was the was the big hit off it. Yeah, still. So I think you know. Beyonce's strength always was that sort of sassy pop, and yeah, and it's interesting because uh, if I was a boy, it was meant to be the big single off it, mm. and you know the single ladies, the B side, and really, well, it was a double A side, double, yeah, but yeah, yeah. certainly when we were involved, every, they were all talking about if I was a boy, this is going to be the big record, this is going to, you know, mm. Beyonce is going to move into a sort of more, you know, sort of more mature direction, mm. and Halo, and that. You know, she just did that dance and that, you know, great. Yeah, it's iconic, isn't you it? You know, yeah. riff in, in, in Single Ladies was just was just Beyonce in her element. And so I, I'm not sure that she necessarily followed the sort of darker, deeper, you know, direction. Quite rightly, she went on to do, do more sort of upbeat things. And I think that's what she's great at. What's your memories of Once in a Lifetime? Because were you involved in the writing yeah. of that one? That got a Golden Globe nomination, didn't it? Yeah. Um, and that was part of the film Cadillac Records. That's right, right? yeah. So what's your, what's your fondest memories of, of recording that? Well, we wrote that with uh, Scott McFarnan, and he, um, we went to see one of Beyonce's uh, representatives, um, uh, Jay Brown, and he was staying in the Hilton by uh, Hyde Park. Mm-hmm. And so we, you know, we went up to his hotel room um, to play him this song, and Scott got the guitar out and and played. And I can remember looking across uh, Hyde Park wow. when he played this song, and he did such a beautiful performance. I mean, of this song, and you could see Jay Brown was like, "Oh, we have to have this song. You know, this is this is just a great song uh, for Beyonce." And and she tried it and sounded great, and that was it really. And it, you know, some of the songs, it was just like that. As I said, she was, she was up for trying things and it, it just worked for her. And When you've written hundreds of, of great songs or riffs, at which you have, um, where, where is the creative well you go to um, when you've got a blank sheet of paper in front of you? 
there's a question. You know, I don't know really. You just got to sort of try and find a word that resonates or think about your life really. I mean, I, I like working with people who who are a bit loud or got a bit of personality and I like to tap that, mm. you know, and try and help give it some form. I think the things I, I write myself these days are sort of slightly darker and... <laughs> I mean, I still work with James from EMF because right. we have a really good chemistry, James and I do, and we've been writing some songs, and that that's great because he's he's got some he's got a really good energy, and he comes up with things, and I just again sort of edit them and send them in the right way, and then occasionally throw an idea in there, and you know maybe it comes back to that thing we started with about sort of having a look at the whole picture and about how how that's going to connect to someone you mm. know? because you can get very lost when you're sort of throwing ideas out there and thinking about your life and how you feel because you feel it you're you're you know you're in your own head and you feel something and you and when you say it it means it to you but does it does it connect to someone else does somebody else feel it do they understand it and I think I've always been a bit of a policeman about whether somebody else understands it. And I think that's why I like sort of taking an idea and refining it until it's like, yeah, you know, you just get this sort of sixth sense when a song hits a level where you, you don't know why, but you think, oh, that's, that means something. That's, mm. that's, that's making me move. That's making me feel. That's making me think. That's, and, and, I like sort of chopping it and changing it and trying this and trying that and until until it does make me feel something. And when you have that feeling, when it uh, makes you feel something, how do you then feel having to hand over your song to a producer who can change it up and chop it up potentially? And you put an interesting face there. <laughs> yeah, that's a two-edged sword because on the one hand, you know, I don't know that production is my strongest point. Mm -hmm. You know, although I did produce. Um, uh, unbelievable with Ralph Jezzard and I got involved in the sounds and um, and the way it should sound I think uh, as I've got older I think I've come across a lot of younger people who are so much better at it than I am mm. um, especially these days you know new sounds come and people are just really good at Ed who you just met yeah, um, yeah, yeah. he's so good at, at things I love working with him and so I think you have to be prepared to to hand it over to somebody and and let them run with with the ideas, but also you know police that the emotions are still coming across and, yeah. and that the uh, and it's good you know I know enough about production to sort of you know understand why something might be working and something won't be working and so you know I still stick my tuppence worth in and. You know, I'm the annoying voice at the back of the room is like, oh, you know, that's not working. We've got to try it this way or, um, but I'm fine. You know, I, I, I like collaborating. I think collaborating is a great thing. You, you know, you, you certainly get more than you give up, I think. Yeah. What about, um, so other than key changes, what are the specific changes to your approach when you are writing for someone else to sing? Hmm. Yeah, for me, I think I like to understand the person and I and make sure that something comes from them. You know, I love. Listen, I, I I'm happy to be transparent. I love if I can work with somebody, even just organize an atmosphere in the room where they are. You know they can write a song that really means something. I'm, I'm happy to do with that. You know, I don't want to, I won't take any publishing. Mm. You know, it's fine. You know, just write a song. That's great. It means something to you. You know, if I, and I, if I can, you know, if I can be instrumental that in, about that in some way, that's when I'm, I've been successful. And hopefully I can help musically. Hopefully I can help with lyrics, which is what I do more and more of these days. You right, know, okay. it's like, it's like, how are you saying that in a way that somebody will understand, mm. you know, or feel? And I think that's what I get involved with more and more. 
these days. You've got any examples of that when you've particularly come in, come in with particular lyrics or you tweak stuff? Um, there's, I mean, I suppose, you know, that, that was my role with Amanda, you know, and you know, when we wrote Tattoo, um, you know, she, she had this great stream of consciousness stuff coming out with the melody and, you know, and she's like, oh, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, you know, I want, want to call it Tattoo. And I just, I knew that if you had to write a song called Tattoo, you've got to use the image where, and I just think, you know, I just said, well, it, you know, and you're on my heart like a tattoo, you know. So, nice. you know, uh, it's just, you've just got to be that clear and that direct and that sort of honest about it. And then, mm. and too, when we were writing the song uh, Red, um, that Daniel Merriweather did. Yeah, that was a huge hit, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. that did really well. So I don't really listen to much pop, and I listened to that song. I was like, I knew the chorus. Like, it showed, yeah. it's so interesting how that bleeds into every yeah. walk of life, doesn't it? A song yeah. like that. Really knew that chorus. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it, we wrote that one with Scott McFarnan as well, and he'd had this sort of line about his dad, um, and I can't do this by myself, or something about the... Uh, or the, all of the problems are uh, are all in your head. Mm. And again, you know, it's, and, and Amanda was there going, so we have to write a song called Red, you know, and I, and, and I was trying to give it some form, you know, you know, because Scott was like, you know, it, it's about my dad. And Amanda was like, you know, we need a word like red to, to, to encapsulate this. And I said, well, you took something perfect and you painted it red, you know. Nice. Yeah. And so you know, to try and find form for the emotion. And again, you see, that's, I've always, I always think you've got to try and find a punchline that, that, that says it in, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a narrative way, but in a, like an emotional way that involves a narrative. And, and I guess that's what I, I still, what I try to do, you know, we've been writing a song with, um, I've been writing a song with James, uh, from EMF with James Atkin. Mm. And, uh, and I was just thinking about that today. It's, it's called people and just trying to find a way to say something about including people and, and, uh, um, uh, and just sort of, for me, that's the crux of it. It's like when to try and take the emotion about including people, but you know, what, how people should be and something about, do you feel, you know, how all the evils filtering through and, and then, but then people, can I hear you? you no, know, all the voices behind the noises, they're all people too. Mm. And so it's just trying to find a way to tell a story w with emotion. And that's what I love. That's what I try and get is what the person, the singer is trying to say. And I try and give it form. Mm. in a way that people would understand and feel that's a fascinating insight that thank you for that in um what skills do you think um people who have really kind of made it like yourself in the music industry have that are kind of overlooked by young people so what are there any transferable skills from jobs you had when you were very young before you made it as a musician you think actually that that allowed me to do x y and z i i, I managed to keep doing what i'm doing because wordsmiths are rarer than the other skills involved in the music industry i mean this is why is that i don't know i mean there's some great wordsmiths you know mm. great young pop writers but i think maybe there's a tendency to dumb things down mm. because that's sort of, they sort of people feel like that's what pop songs need mm. i really don't think that's the case you know i think you get I mean, i love those chain smoker things you know it was so simple and that melody just melody just went round and round and round those rhymes what were those rhymes in the chain smokers about you know because where he's right you know in the back seat of your rover that i know you can't afford bite that tattoo on your shoulder pull the sheets right off your off the corner of the mattress that you stole from your roommate back in boulder mm. i mean it's genius it's yeah. like it's like it's poetry and just like a strange random lot of rhymes i mean it's just but it's really clever there's no need for it to dumb down. You just mentioned that it could be a case that's dumbing down. To, to what end? Why do we need to do that? I mean, it's, you know? I think simple is good. Yeah. And and again, that comes back to being understandable. I think it is. There's an it's an art, and I think you know having a love for storytelling and and a love for words 
is a great thing. I mean, like that, again, Ian Brown. I mean, he he's yeah. a master. I mean, mm. he just had a turn of phrase, and again, simplicity and emotion, and mm. you know, what a wordsmith and fear. I mean, that such a great oh, song, that, just, isn't it? yeah. What you know, there's it's a joy for words, yeah. you know, and a genius and. And, and uh, actually, talking about him, because we we're going to come on to that. So you you involved in uh, a couple of songs, including For the Glory. Um, so he actually had a Stone Roses references in that song. I don't know yeah. if you remember. Was, he, was that, that was something deliberate, you, yeah. Yeah, so that something yeah. you put in there, or was that something... Do you know what, that was Amanda. That was Amanda, that right, was Amanda, okay, yeah. yeah. No, that was very nice. So what was your memories of working with Ian? Yeah, just that he's he's a lovely man, and that he's he is a, t- a talent, you know. He just, he's that, he's that somebody that... It has a personality, you know. Mm. He's got something to say, and I just had a great way of, of saying it. And just, you know, I mean, I, it's pointless going on about me working with Ian Brown because he's the talent, you know. He, yeah, he made it work. And on that record, you weren't involved in the because they they were going to do one song that was supposed to be that they started doing a song on that record, and it sounded quite a lot like in the year twenty five twenty five. Right, okay, so right. The, it was in the year 2525, and they realised, actually, we're ripping off that song, so we'll just do a cover of it instead. Great. Right, and they end up releasing the single. But one question I did have about songwriting, are you owned in regards to who you can write songs for? Can I ask that as a songwriter? When you get into that position, is there limitations as to how, who your songs can go to? Oh. No, you can... Yeah. That's good. You can write, write with whoever... That's good. That's and good. Uh, why, so why why would you think that? Well, I just wondered if it was a case of if um, an artist is like a record company owns a particular talent for writing songs, and it might be a case that they can only write for the people on that label or anything like that. You know, maybe that was a case back in the day with Mo, Motown or something. Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. They were in house writers. It was, yeah. That and was they had the, exclusive yeah. right, and and perhaps as artists they are, but certainly songwriters these days don't work. work so you well. could work with whoever. Yeah, you want to. I mean. If somebody invests a lot of money in somebody being an artist, uh, whatever they do, a record company would want to own, I guess. Mm-hmm. But uh, as writers, no, you're just you want to you want to write with whoever you can. And what are examples of techniques you've seen producers use to get the best out of um, either yourself or another or an other artist in a recording studio? Um, this isn't something I've seen used, but I always try and do this. Um, I, I can remember hearing about how um, Brian Eno, when he first started working with, oh, I can't remember who it was, he made them all dinner. He just wanted to put people at their ease, I think. And then, you know, let the creativity happen. And Brian Eno did an amazing remix of Unbelievable once, and I got to chat to him. And, really? Did yeah. He? And, and, you know, and I picked his brains a little bit. And, and in those days, he was just using a couple of bits of equipment and he he just record lots of different things on these and then then start editing it you know and i think it's very much like a sort of throw it at the wall and see what happens yeah. and you know keep the good bits do you ever do the thing where it's like oh this is just a guy take i put my computer on there and just press record and just run a, a thing mm-hmm. and we just sing things and and you know and people are like oh i forgot what is it i've got it's like it's okay it's okay i've, I've recorded yeah. it and then we go back and listen to things and just sort of let it happen organically and um so i wonder ian if you could tell us um, what are some examples of uh, or the best examples you've seen of um techniques used by producers uh, to get the best out of people in the studio i i love that story brian eno uh tells about how he always makes people dinner before he gets started and i like to put people at their ease and and ask them about them really because I, you know I, I work with singers I'm, I myself am a terrible singer um, and I like people to feel comfortable enough to talk about themselves mm. um, the best one is always to ask you know are you in a relationship as well you know really yeah That's because it. then because pe- when people get started on that you know then you cut, start to see what they really feel about stuff and of course relationships always get to how people feel and and is that dependent on what the song is that they're going to be singing or just does that just cut through to the emotional i think core it straight tr- away yeah it just cuts through to the emotional core wow you know straight <laughs> away and you know and in, and in terms of sort of being in the studio i like to sort of stay positive and push on and not get bogged down in in the little details and i think in those songwriting sessions where you're doing a, a track in a day and you're writing a song and you know maybe even finishing a record you know, you, you want to be making those big decisions about, about is it the right word? 
Is it the right sound? Is it the right melody? Uh, and, you know, keeping it positive and, and feeling it. And I think, you know, you don't want to get bogged down in those little details. Um, and, and, and always, oh, did, did that feel quite right? And, uh, and it was a privilege watching Mikel Erickson from Stargate record vocals. I mean, he's a master. And he somehow, he's like, he uses Jedi mind tricks. He, <laughs> he, he sort of doesn't get involved in, in the emotion of it somehow. Mm. He's just like, um, one more time, one more time. Uh, that's great. Next one. Next line. Do this. You know, and, and he, cause he's sort of compiling it as he goes along and, and he's recorded some amazing vocals and just seeing how he does it. You know, it's probably got, it's, it's got too much to do with, you know, how, the right microphone and how it sounds on the microphone. And I think some, some you know, I've, se- I've seen some singers get very, you know, caught up in, in, in self-consciousness and, uh, and sort of sab- sabotaging themselves. Whereas, you know, I think if you just keep going and keep going and, um, and stay positive, I think th- those are the best, um, best vocals I think and and where, where you get caught up in the emotion of it which reminds me of uh, uh, the uh, when James did the vocal for Unbelievable I think they had a few beers right and uh, I think even I think Derry went in the vocal booth with James and they had a couple of beers and James just sang it and they were just sort of like <laughs> dancing around and did it I think he did it in one take really yeah sounds it sounds like yeah. he's loving it yeah as an Ivor Novello winning um, songwriter and Golden Globe nominated songwriter, I have a challenge for you. Here we go. Um, have you ever thought about writing a song or presenting a song to um, a major artist that's going to be heard by lots of people that's in a different time signature? When you say, when you say in a different time signature, you mean like... Rather than 4-4, four, 3-4, four, four, a different type that, that, that isn't what is expected on mainstream radio. Um You've now got the clout to surely be able to do that, and it wouldn't be interesting. It would be different. That's but how would that go down? <laughs> yeah, but, that, but that's sort of contradicting what I've been trying to say about, about, simple, about fitting simple. in and sort of, I don't say fitting in, but just like connecting to people. And if the for, you know, song is, the songs are a very simple form. It's like, it hasn't changed much for many, mm. many years. And, and trying to mess, with, you know, I keep seeing people that are trying to mess with the form, and uh, I can, you know, I've often seen sort of producers come to me with these things and say, say they're, oh, I've, this is we've entered a new type of music, and when they say that, I know it's going to be bad <laughs> right. because it's just going to sound different, and yeah. it's not going to be right. And you sort of want to get involved in how to make it right within the form, which it, you know these days is fairly simple you know mm. it is 4-4 four, four, and melodies are happening in a certain way and sounds are happening in a certain way and don't you want to challenge audiences and challenge listeners by maybe doing something a little bit different yeah you know what maybe maybe you can I mean there's very very few for, for our listeners there's very very few songs in the last 25 years that have been a hit uh, and, and and been in the top ten charts that hasn't been in four four. So it's, it's it's almost you know there's very very few. Um, but I just thought maybe it'd be something different to bring to the table. You know, it, it very possibly would. And sometimes I just write songs for the sake of writing songs, and who knows what happens to them. But so far, mm. you know, and there's some songs out there. Um, Amanda and I wrote a song once called Deep Water that changed from four four into three four halfway through. Mm-hmm. But I just think it just upset everybody who heard it when it changed. They were like, well, what's going on there? What's going on there? You know? Yeah, yeah. Changing forms. Hmm. It would stand out so much on the radio like a sore thumb. and be like, oh, well, that's something really, really different that people, someone's doing. It wouldn't be interchangeable with different things. Well, um, Perfect uh, by Ed Sheeran is in three time. Oh, is it? Right. Yeah. Okay. And, that's interesting. There, yeah, you can mess with those forms. And mm. I, do you know what? Occasion, occasionally I, I try things, you know, I, I don't care that much about quite how it fits in, but I do try and make mm. them relevant. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm sort of interested in how the words work and the melody works. Mm. And that for me, I find fascinating. I, four fours 
still got an awful lot of songs left in it, I think. Yeah, yeah. I played, played um, Take Five to my son the other day. Right. That was and? interesting. Getting him, he, and he usually listens to um, uh, Metallica, so he, you know, oh, right. to hear something that was in, like that, that was in five time, I think was interesting. And But, kid, you know, kids are open to anything, I suppose. Great if uh, we could invent a new type of music, but I don't know. I, I'm... I don't know that it's going to be me. I think my my time for inventing a new type of music is <laughs> is it, gone. I love I love words and melodies and and you worked with um, Florence and the Machine on bedroom hymns. Is that right? right? Yeah, That's tell right, us about yeah. that experience. Uh, wonderful. Again, she's there's another person with personality pouring yeah. out of her. Yeah, she's pacing around the room like ideas pouring out of her. We we did that in um, a studio in New York. Where, where um, Smashing Pumpkins Guitarist Studio. Yeah, yeah, right. And he had all these amazing guitar guitars around. And I just sort of picked up this guitar and uh, did that riff, did the guitar riff for it. And, um, you know, again, Amanda and Florence just started riffing on Florence's sort of wail. Mm. I mean, she has this wonderful sort of emotion in her voice and incredible range of yeah. and she opens up so much as yeah. Well. yeah work with dave mccracken who funnily enough is ian brown's producer oh right okay who, and that was the connection with ian and um and he did this great beat and and it sort of and it just just sort of came out in a moment really and i think uh you know i think that's a special track it's a shame it's a shame i think it could could possibly have been a single or you know, had another version of it, but I remember Baz Luhrmann really loving it because he put it really? in the um, Great Gatsby movie Did he? Uh, trailer. He put it on the trailer. Oh wow! And uh, that's a great trailer. You know, yeah. when that kicks in, in in the party scene. Right. Okay. Um, that's very famous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. You've worked with some of the most powerful personalities in the music industry. What's their biggest weakness? I suppose it, it is a terrible weakness to sort of exist in an ivory tower. And you can't help but in a bit of a bubble when you have that sort of attention. And it's it's admirable to see how some of those artists have managed to retain some sense of normalcy through all that and kept their feet on the ground and, and continued to be creative. And mm. I think that's a, a great strength. But, but I can see how it's a weakness to be isolated, I think. And have people around you that are going, oh, yeah, you're great, you're great. Yes, people. Yes, men. Yes, yes people. people. Yeah. It's so easy to surround yourself. It's so nice to surround yourself with people who are going like, oh, yeah, you're mm. oh, yeah, you're, what a great idea. Even when it's not. And I think you've got to be a tough person to know when you're getting good advice, even if it's not what you want to hear. Mm. Because when the whole world's telling you you're great, surely you're great, you know. But when you're trying to do, you know, more music and, you know, things are different and... You know, might not. You know, is that 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 difficult second album syndrome, isn't it? Or difficult fifth album or seventh <laughs> yeah. album? You know, it's like how do you get to be good? And I think it, it was interesting seeing um, uh, Beyonce. Uh, we did some playback sessions when we were working on the I Am Sasha Fierce album, and so all the after the, you know, the day was done, everybody went into one studio and played all the songs and. We did one day when we, you know, we played a bunch of songs and Stargate played some and Tricky and Dream were there and they played some and Amanda and I played a couple of songs and, you know, everyone was like punching in the air and going, oh, they're sounding great. Mm. And this was a time when Beyonce's father was still managing her. Mr. Knowles was there and he listened to it all. And so when it was finished, he's, he's like, yeah, but where's your pop hit at 128 beats per minute? And, you know, you could see... Beyonce was slightly frustrated by this, mm. you know. Yeah, but these, you know, these these songs are great. These are hit songs, and he's like, "Yeah, but you haven't got an upbeat song for the radio." A day later, two days later, we did the playback session, and there was single ladies. Really? Oh wow! So his input actually. Cre- oh wow! So, you know, that's interesting. It's good that you've got somebody there. Yeah. Going. You gotta. You gotta have a critical friend. You've you gotta have a critical it, friend. Yeah, someone who's gonna. You gotta have someone who's who's sort of gonna sort of keep you on the straight and narrow. And so, from uh, recording uh, with Beyonce to um, recording with Vic and Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've been about this, haven't you? This is the highlight. 
<laughs> Love Vic and Bob. Um, so no, uh, joke aside. So in, with EMF, you did you re- you released a single, didn't you? With, yeah. Um, um, it I'm wasn't Disney. It was oh yeah, I'm a believer. That was yeah, it. Yeah. Right, yeah. And oh, I, I watched it today. You were on top of the pops and like you dressed as the monkeys and stuff. Like that. Was that something you really wanted to do, or was that something that you know? I how did that come about? Yeah, Vic and Bob had had done uh, the single with the Wonder Stuff. That's right. Um, Dizzy. Dizzy. Yeah. And I think they they loved indie music and they loved working with with yeah. sort of uh, bands they liked. Yeah. And they said um, they said oh let's let's do I'm a believer and. Um, I just, I How did remember. you guys become involved in it? I think I used to just bump into Jim Moyer, Vic Reeves, yeah. uh, occasionally, and, and Bob Mortimer, and, and, and like in the Grouch or something, and mm. and they were like, "Oh yeah, no, we should we should do something together." Wow. You know, it was probably just like a, a yeah, and like, "Oh yeah, let's try it." I think they had tried "I'm a Believer" um, on some TV show and played it back and said, "Oh, let's go," and it sounded great. So we said, "Yeah, let's do this." <laughs> And it was just, we just thought we'd have some fun and and give it a go. And, and it was a hit. It got and it was a hit. Yeah. It was a hit again, back to you know, like a bit of fun and a, and a press story. is mm. It's always a great backdrop to a to a record. I watched it earlier, so it is on YouTube for anybody who wants to uh, have a look for it. So quite a serious question here, but what was your biggest setback in your career? And how did you approach overcoming it? I know that, I know James and I... Um, are always tortured by how EMF was such a great idea in its first incarnation as a sort of bad boy pop band, mm-hmm. and and I think us trying to be something else sort of ended up making it being something very complicated, you know. And then we went off and did different things, and I think it's a real shame. Because, you know, James and I still have such great chemistry. And I think we should have just kept making records. Mm-hmm. And we could have figured it out. Hey, listen, we're, we're, we can still make a record. I said, yeah. I'm going to remedy it by making another record with James. Awesome, do it. EMF. Do it. Um, because those relationships are precious mm. in your life. Music's about chemistry with people, you know. And when you have a really great chemistry, I think you should just make it. And but bands are also like marriages. And, you know, and you can just get involved with things and uh, and fall out about things and mm. about silly things and creativity trumps all that and I think you just need to you know keep doing that and I think you know and the same with Amanda and mm-hmm. and other things I've been involved with you know I think that when you meet somebody and you have a good chemistry and you make good music like, that's precious like, that's 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 what records are they're sort of like the record of of a precious mm interaction between people and that's why bands are great you know, the sound those people when you get camaraderie together guess, there's yeah. a camaraderie in a way people play and put things together and that's that's really special and it does make me sad to think of the all those relationships and all those sort of situations that perhaps i don't you know, that I, I'm not still doing, you know, and I wish I could still be doing everything I, I always mm. did. And I managed to write a bunch of hit records in 2008 with Amanda. And I know Amanda became very troubled by having to churn it out, I think. Mm. And, and that's she a shame. She was part of a machine then. That yeah. Was, yeah. And I think, built of like, right, right, yeah, right, right, and she, yeah. she's, that really troubled her. And I think she wanted to move on to other things because she couldn't just, turn it out mm. you know it had to mean something to her and i think and and she does right now when she feels it's something that she 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 can relate to and feel and and she's great when she does that and and i think it has to be something like that and it's a shame that we didn't continue writing pop hits really and but you know it's fine on to on to other things and what's your um what's your funniest or fondest memories of emf so you had some wild times in the band, you had some wild times. What are your funniest or oh, fondest dear. memories? I don't know what. what the well, ones? I don't know what I can repeat on yeah, repeat uh, on, on record. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I, could, I, I can, but I mean, it was they're, they're just they're just you know great fun. They were just a love, you know. You know, we we had such a brilliant time. We were, yeah. I mean, I think I was the old man of the band. I was twenty five, and James and Mark were twenty one, and Derry and Zach were. 18 mm. and, and we wow. had a hit record that's young isn't it yeah. so, that is young 
And so, so did you feel like you were the captain? I, I mean, from a songwriting point of view, you were anyway, but did you feel a responsibility? A I tried, but yeah. I didn't have a chance of controlling <laughs> that lot, you know. I mean, when we played the Universal Amphitheatre in Los Angeles, I think that was 6,000 people, and we that was our, you know, we, we, we sold it out. Nice. And that was a great moment, and I think we broke the T-shirt record that had been set by... Face No More or something before that and we saw really? more t-shirts than t-shirts Face No More and we were like yay wow. uh, Top of the Pops Top of the Pops oh, that's got yeah, to be cool. that's tell got, us about yeah, that that's got a great moment tell yeah. us about that whole experience from when you arrive on Top of the Pops to, to when you leave what's that like we grew up watching Top of the Pops yeah. and for, for younger people they won't re- understand the resonance of that but you know we're, we're, but it was the I mean there, so there's four channels at the time in the UK and Top of the Pops on maybe Thursday or Friday night 7 o'clock or 7.30 the whole nation really the watched it. The whole nation watched it to see what was happening in music because there wasn't <laughs> the internet then. Yeah. And, you know, I'd spent my life watching Top of the Pops and going upstairs and playing my guitar afterwards because I wanted to be on Top of the Pops. I wanted to play. I remember wow. seeing Back a Love by Echo and the Bunnymen and just, oh, just like going upstairs and like nice. playing it and just, and to, to actually be on there for the first time was incredible. So what was that whole day? So who else was on the bill the first time you did it? Can you remember? The first time. Mm. I remember being on there once and uh, Kylie Minogue and Jason Donovan were on there. <laughs> and, uh, Especially for you? <laughs> I think it was. I think it could have. I think it was that. And um, I, th- I probably watched that as like a yeah. six-year-old. Like I probably yeah. watched that, yeah. And, oh, wow. Jason, and Jason Donovan came into our dressing room and came and hung, hung out with us. Really? Yeah. And that it was like, so and he, he was up for it as well. He was, he was, he enjoyed yeah. just hanging out. Sadly, we didn't persuade Kylie to come in, but yeah. But uh, and did you play live, or was it uh, to a backing track? Or? Well, they had this weird thing back in the day where they it was meant to be live. So I think you were meant to record the backing track live, and then James sang live on top of it. Right. Okay. Um, so you all mime in, and James sang. But yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you can have a bit of fun. So yeah. So that that must have been obviously such a highlight for you. What What else? What other? What were the stories you tell your friends? Japan, Once playing in Japan, playing Japan, you know. I mean, well, you go all that way, and people know you. And Japan's so strange as well because, you know, I remember everybody in Japan, like the girls would put their um, bags on the side of the uh, venue, and nobody would steal them. And then at the end of the thing, they just grab their bags and they go, <laughs> and there wouldn't be one, you know, beer can or on the floor afterwards. It was, you know. But you had other gigs where I mean, I watched an interview with you about twenty five years ago. It was maybe about twenty years ago, and um, it was mayhem. Like people were throwing glasses at the stage and that kind of thing. And that's so funny because I played a couple of weeks ago um, at Yulu yep. with Goldheart Assembly, their friends. Yeah. And the last time I played that venue was supporting Carter just after we sort of had a hit record and. Our management had a record label and Carter had released some records with our management's record label. So we had a connection mm. and they said, oh, do you want to come and support us? And we were like, yeah, that'd be great. You know, we liked the sort of, they were cool and we wanted to be part of that. And I think they liked that, you know, we were yeah. hit at the time. So that was sort of funny. And and we went, we came on stage and they had this really hardcore audience and they, they, their audience started throwing bottles at us. And like, Was that expected before you went out there? Did well, you we knew it might happened? be a little bit... Yeah. bit edgy yeah or you know that they might be, be a little bit of disapproval but you know we we were gen you know if you see us play live it's it's got a real energy yes. and it's re- it's it's you know we're quite a tough band you know we're a great mm. live band and people started throwing things at, uh, at us and then i think milf jumped in the audience and tried to say something to somebody and somebody hit him and then he, and, and there were literally this folk fight broke out you know, with the front row of the audience and us, and <laughs> it just was absolute mayhem. And um, and I, I remember Neil Tennant was at the gig. Oh, really? Because he Special was on Parlophone, and we wow. were on Parlophone, and they got invited. Oh, and he said afterwards, "Oh, it just reminded me of the punk gigs." He said, "Really?" And uh, amazing. And fun. It was a very. It was a. It had a great energy, but it was a bit scary. Oh, man. So we'll talk about EMF, and um, obviously there was a sad period in, in, in the band's history when um, EMF lost a uh, member, um, Zach Foley, in tragic circumstances at the age of 31 in 2002. I wonder if you could pay tribute to Zach, both as a person and a musician. So so what did EMF lose that day 
as an individual and also from a musical perspective. Yeah, no, Zach was my friend, and I think he was you know, everybody's friend. Derry and Zach grew up together, and right. You know what can you say? I mean, it, it's like you just lose somebody special, and he was very funny, and you know he had a great energy, and and you know it's funny you say to me what 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 am I going to tell my kids about? And you know I think that's I'm going to say watch out because you know there's. You know, drugs are out there and you know you get involved in that and it's not something where you're you can necessarily be in control and you know I just think you know he got involved in drugs and and you know they they took him away and uh, you know just you know that's a terrible part of the music industry I think mm. and you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to say, really. And as a musician, as a because he was the bassist. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, he just had a great energy and you know a, a great feel, and, and you know, I, I think, I think perhaps it was his energy as a person more than anything. Yeah. When we started out as a band, and he just he was just so up and funny, and that. I, that's what lent that f- a lot of that energy to that first album, and that you know really? had that sort of it encapsulated. His yeah, the feel yeah. and all of it, you know him and Derry too. Mm. You know they have a great sort of. They used to love listening to um to a Primus. Oh yeah, Johnny yeah. was a race car driver. I just remember oh. Zach yeah. playing that all the time, and yeah. you know so. You know, I think we tried to channel that with some house piano, and that's what EMF was. You know, <laughs> Zach leaping around to Johnny was a race car driver wow. with some house piano on it. Interesting, and, yeah. Um, um, yeah. Thank you for for talking about that so honestly. And you talked about kind of uh, or touched upon advice to, to young musicians. It's obviously a very broad question, but um, other than what you discussed there about drugs, what what are the things that you think? musicians, young musicians at a young age going into the industry need to be aware of? That it's, that it's hard. Mm-hmm. I think the greatest thing about being a musician is that you that you sort of got to be a positive person. You know, you wake up every day and you, you, you're making something out of nothing. Mm. And that's a wonderful thing, but you've got to kind of keep believing and it is a blessing to, to be able to do that and, and to make it work and you know, have have some small victories, and you know, I'm fortunate enough to, have, you know, made made a living at it, and mm. and had a had a few records, but it's certainly it's certainly been touch and go. You know, I've had years when it's been hard, and but I don't know. I just maybe I'm a selfish person because I just it's what makes me happy, and I just do it anyway, and. I'm, I'm lucky that I, that I can, and it, it is a form of selfishness, you know, because you just you just want to articulate what you feel and, and put it out there. And when I was young, a young musician, I just it just lit up my life to play the guitar and to hear the guitar, and and I just remember that feeling, you know, in my first punk band, jumping mm. about on stage, <laughs> and I just want to feel that now i think so just if you know if you're a young musician and you feel something just that just follow that follow that road wherever it takes you and sage advice thank you very much what's the most precious piece of music memorabilia you own i have a guitar signed by Robbie Krieger, the guitarist of The Doors. Really? Yeah. And you loved them growing up, didn't you? You liked The Doors. Yeah, I read that. The Doors growing up. Wow. And uh you know, my first band was was an attempt to be, be the, the Doors, doors. <laughs> basically. And I, you know, all, I worked out all his guitar solos, um, and well, I, thankfully, I got a uh, Gibson record, rather Gibson guitars, mm-hmm. gave me a um, an endorsement when nice. uh, EMF was doing well, and the guy from Gibson said to me, "Oh, who's who's your favourite guitarist?" As well, Robbie Krieger. Okay, and then and that's all it was. Okay, <laughs> yeah, just like, he was just like okay, and and then we played a show at um, 
in Los Angeles and the guy from Gibson came down. He said, oh, there's somebody I want you to meet. No. And he brought Robbie Krieger <whistles> backstage. And somebody took a photograph of me and Robbie Krieger, like, talking. And I'm there like that with my, with my mouth open, catching flies. And, uh, and there's Robbie Krieger sort of looking at me. Um, <laughs> have you got that photo? I have got that photo oh, somewhere. It's got to be it. somewhere. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't say a word to him. I just, oh, I, I was just dumbfounded, and he, they, they, he just gave me this guitar that I, you know, the guy from Gibson got, got a Gibson SG, which was which was a uh, Robbie Krieger's guitar, wow. and he signed it uh, to uh, Ian. You're unbelievable, Robbie Krieger at the door. Nice. <laughs> so it's just that's a beautiful thing that's priceless yeah. because I didn't know that and I know that from the research how much the doors meant to you and particularly him so that is yeah. just yeah, that's, that's worth it all that yeah. is that is, that is absolutely that's a great moment. two last questions first one what ambitions do you still have left just to keep writing good songs I guess mm. it's funny to, a couple of writer friends of mine have got involved in writing musicals and, you know, and then recently I tried writing some lyrics for a musical because somebody was, and that was great fun. Mm. And, I, and I don't know. I mean, musicals sometimes some musicals, you know, are not great. But I went, I saw um, Groundhog Day. Yeah. Recently, with Tim Minchin did that, and that was great. Was it good? Yeah. Oh, he did such a great job. And I don't know. Maybe there's maybe there's a there's something to do in my dotage. Yeah, and that seems like a... That'd be a different challenge, wouldn't it? It'd be different. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's interesting because certainly the thing I was trying recently had a... You know, the, the melody was already written and the story was written and the music was written. Mm. And so you just had to try and encapsulate the story point in a song at that moment. But in a funny way, that's what I've been doing my whole life, you know, mm. trying, to, trying to tell a little story in, in a song and... So maybe maybe that's the next thing. Um, what fears do you have for the music industry, and how might those fears be addressed? Um, uh, fears slightly. Hmm. So, uh, that's a tough one. I don't know. I think the music industry sort of feels like it's in rude health because I know the streaming thing is bringing some more revenue back into the industry that was lost during the pirating era. Mm. Um, and fears for the music industry. Sometimes I, you know, sometimes you, 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 just, you think, oh my God, who, where, where, is, where are the next big things going to come from? Because there seem to be lo lots of new things. But I think that's a, I think that's a sort of case of perspective. Mm. You know, it's all you know. From where we're looking now, it seems like in the past there were always these great things, and now there's a lot of okay things and a few good things. But I think if you look back in the past, you know, there were loads of okay things then as well. You just forgotten them, and and so I don't know. I don't have many fears for the music industry. I think there's loads of young people out there making great music. Um, I, I love new, edgy things. You know. Uh, um, I love Skepta and I love, you know, and I'm, I'm too old for it, but I just, mm. I, I love seeing people doing edgy, creative things and just like they always did. So I, I, I have no fears for the music industry. I think young people will continue making great music and, and long may it continue. Going to put you on the spot here. There's an acoustic guitar there. Could you play the riff to Unbelievable? <laughs> <laughs> Is it tuned? <laughs> uh, let's, we can tune it, can't we? If, even if we it's can't. Not. That's one thing I can... Oh, it's a... Thank you so much, Ian, for appearing on the Stage Show podcast. Uh, you've contributed to songs that are going to be played for generations and generations to come. Uh, keep up the good work. Uh, we hope you enjoyed appearing, and thanks for being such a great guest on the Stage Show podcast. Thank you very much. 
For more episodes featuring Guns N' Roses guitarist Richard Fortas, Tony Visconti on producing David Bowie's fine album Black Star, uh, the comedian Stuart Lee uh, on his creative processes, uh, Ezra Furman, uh, Wolfgang Fleur of Kraftwerk, Gem Archer of Oasis, and George Vajestica uh, of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, go to thestagelefpodcast.com, follow us on Twitter at the Stage Left Pod, like us at facebook.com forward slash the Stage Left Podcast, um, and come say hi on our Instagram page as well, where you'll see all the photos of uh, all the interviews we do, um, and let us know where you're listening from. We hope you enjoyed the episode and we'll see you next month for Dan McDougall of Liam Gallagher's band.